Good morning. I'd like to call this uh, joint hearing of the Committee on Transportation Infrastructure and also the Committee on o Oversight and Government Reform to order. Today, uh, the topic of the hearing is America's Presidential Libraries, their mission and their future. Um, the order of business today will be uh, will be opening statements uh, by members, and uh, then we'll turn to our panel. Let me say at the outset, this is uh, probably one of the more unique uh, hearings in Congress and, uh, that is today going to focus on a unique subject, and that's, uh, again, the, the mission, the future uh, of our presidential libraries. And we uh, decided to do that jointly. Our committee has some responsibility, legislative responsibility, uh, under the Economic Development uh, Public Buildings and um, uh, Emergency Management Subcommittee. Uh, also, the, uh, the important Government Reform and Oversight Committee, uh, chaired by my colleague, the gentleman from California, uh, has very important legislative and oversight responsibility over presidential uh, libraries. So uh, a rather unique uh, subject and a unique approach. Um, I might say at the outset this, this isn't a, a one of these um, hearings where we, uh, we have a mission of uh, some violation or some problem with the libraries. This is, uh, I think, a very forward-looking um, hearing in trying to assess the current status of our presidential libraries and also their important mission and then their future. It's impossible to have all of them um, in this panel, and today, today's formal hearing uh, is a representation, and we've got a uh, uh, a good, I think, uh, cross-section of some of those involved with the presidential libraries that we'll hear from shortly. I want to thank again uh, Chairman Issa, uh, Chairman Gowdy of the subcommittee, uh, uh, who has say over this uh, also in, uh, again, in government reform, Ms. Norton, and um, Mr. Rahal isn't with us today, but enjoyed his support in having this uh, joint uh, hearing. Uh, the um, uh, other gentleman that uh, has joined us, of course, is Mr. Cummings, and uh, uh, I've had the great honor and privilege of working with him uh, both uh, as a chair and also as a ranking member in the past and uh, appreciate his support on, on uh, government reform and the relationship we've shared over the years. So that's a, a little bit about our mission. Uh, let, me, um, let me say a couple of things. First of all, most folks don't realize we have uh, some public, uh, publicly funded and sponsored presidential libraries, and we also have some private uh, libraries. Many of them start out with uh, private uh, donations and end up in the public realm. Um, I've had uh, the opportunity to visit some of the libraries across the nation, and uh, found it one of the most rewarding experiences uh, that, that uh, I could enjoy, I like a little bit of history like most folks, but it really uh, gives um, the public, um, academia, and um, students, and, uh, and people who are interested in the history of the United States and our presidents, uh, uh, great access information and a tremendous resource and nas national treasure. Um, the, um, the question of why we should uh, have this hearing is uh, uh, really uh, there are a whole host of questions that need to be answered about how we uh, proceed. Uh, right now we are in tough economic times, uh, the federal government. Sometimes some of the libraries that depend on private donations have also experienced some downturns uh, both at visitors and, uh, and revenues. Uh, and then the important question, again, before us is their future mission, how that uh, changes and evolves, and what the federal ro uh, role of participation with these libraries is. Uh, in talking with um, 
the Librarian of Congress. I didn't realize this, but I, I believe he told me that uh, presidential papers uh, from, I guess, Washington uh, through up to Hoover are handled by the Library of Congress and, I guess, the National Archives. And then we began the, uh, the construction and uh, creation of uh, presidential libraries. Uh, there, there are an, a host of questions, as I said, that we hope to answer today. We probably won't get to all of them in this uh, formal hearing. One of the things I like to do, in addition to formal hearings, is have an informal session. And uh, this afternoon, beginning, I believe it's around 2.30, we'll begin uh, over in the Cannon Caucus Room a uh, symposium. And we hope that uh, those uh, other representatives of both the public and private uh, presidential libraries, we know they'll be joining us. And uh, we won't have quite as formal a uh, a discussion as we'll have with the panel before us today. Again, the panel is only representative of all of you who've come today from across the country representing some of these great institutions. So in that symposium and forum, and it's open to members of Congress uh, too, uh, and uh, any of the public, it is a public uh, uh, event, we'll have an opportunity to ask some questions, get some, uh, uh, hopefully a good exchange and commentary on, uh, on some of the questions that will be raised at the hearing today, and again, the important mission that these uh, libraries uh, have. We uh, again thank all of those who have come today. Um, I have had a chance to visit a few of the libraries, the uh, Truman, the Roosevelt, the Nixon, the Reagan, the Kennedy, the Hoover, and uh, I think most recently the Lincoln also. Uh, variety of public and private uh, uh, endeavors. And again, the, just an incredible opportunity for the public to, uh, uh, to uh, walk through again and see and review and have access to the history of our, our uh, leaders uh, over the course of, uh, of uh, uh, many generations. So again, that's the purpose of the uh, formal uh, hearing this morning, uh, the symposium that we'll have this afternoon, a uh, unique opportunity in Congress uh, to sit down and again uh, look at where we are and where we're going with one of our important national treasures and assets uh, uh, that we are the custodians of as far as members of Congress and leaders uh, of, uh, of uh, again, our respective uh, libraries. So with that, let me uh, uh, turn, if I may, to the gentlelady uh, from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to say just a few words and uh, ask to submit my opening statement for the record. I, I look forward to learning more about the presidential libraries uh, as a member of, of both committees your own uh, Transportation Infrastructure Committee and the Committee of Jurisdiction uh, Oversight and Government Reform. I note that there are a large number of visitors to these libraries, uh, over two million, that President Roosevelt uh, built the first, and ever since then, <laughs> uh, apparently every president has felt he must have a presidential library. But it wasn't until 1955 that the Federal Government understood it was dealing with Federal history, Federal papers, and, of course, the Presidential Libraries Act was passed. Um, the relationship of these libraries to their foundations uh, creates something of a hybrid within the Federal system, so oversight is uh, certainly appropriate. Um, uh, they, they have their own foundations, which, of course, are responsible for building these libraries, but these are official documents of the people of the United States. Uh, and this committee uh, or the Congress has a very appropriate role. I ask that my statement be submitted to the record. Without objection. And now let me uh, yield to the uh, co-chair of this joint uh, hearing a uh, gentleman who chairs the Government Reform and Oversight uh, Committee of the House of Representatives uh, from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for holding this joint hearing. As you said earlier, 
many of us on the dais uh, serve on both hearings. So I have members uh, of, of my committee who are sitting here in two roles, just as uh, Ms. Norton and uh, uh, Mr. Cummings are both sitting here in two roles. Uh, there is a difference in the oversight that we will be looking at today. There is no question that for the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, they are looking at the economic impact, the Federal assets themselves, uh, the non, uh, if you will, uh, paper, if you will, Federal assets, particularly the facilities. In a case of our committee, we are looking at a combination of highest and best use for the Federal dollar the cost of paying 100 percent of the cost of archivist at each of these facilities and the cost of basically about 45 percent being the Federal Government and State Government's contribution through to, because of tax deductibility for charities of the other side. So the truth is the tax or, taxpayers are paying for these facilities on both sides. I think all of us on the dais believe it is money well spent, but it is money that has to be looked at carefully. If there were no presidential libraries, there is no question that there would be hundreds of thousands of, of entities involved in every nuance of maintaining those records, pouring through them. On the other hand, it could be that they would be more available as a researcher would want to look through ancient records. There is no question that each of the libraries has a natural struggle, one in which the, uh, the followers and descendants of a president and the president him, himself, if he is still alive, uh, wants to maintain a positive legacy. Everything that happened on their watch was good. Well, in fact, history may show that there were gaping flaws from Jefferson to Nixon, and then we will stay, we'll stay away from those beyond. There have been scandals, and those scandals can, in fact, and may, in fact, be appropriate to have seen within a library. But let's understand there is a balance. Our Presidents represent, for the most part, progress in, a number, in many, many areas, uh, even among the most, if you will, failed or least popular Presidents. Additionally, our committee has, over the last many years, under both Republican and Democratic leadership, had a particular interest in inventory control at the libraries, access to researchers at libraries, and uh, especially protected records, which is a nice way for classified. Presidents operate at the highest level of, uh, of secrecy, and as a result, a great part of what goes on during a President's life is, in fact, classified for 50 years or more. We need to have that protected, protected both from premature release, but we also need to make sure that when the time is right, it can be released. Our committee has, over the years, had a number of legitimate concerns with information that is gone and will never be found, or at least won't be found in our lifetime. So today's hearing is about hearing the good news and hearing from people who have a vested interest in their library doing well while meeting this challenge that Congress has given to primarily the private sector in support of their foundation. With that, I will put the rest in for the record and yield back. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Issa. And let me yield now uh, to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and um, Chairman Issa, to Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Norton. I appreciate you for holding this hearing today on presidential libraries. This is an issue that is very important to the Oversight Committee because we have jurisdiction over the National Archives and Records Administration and the laws that govern presidential libraries. I look forward to working on these issues with Chairman Issa and Chairman Gowdy in his role as Chairman of the Subcommittee with jurisdiction over the National Archives, as well as with the ranking member of that subcommittee, Danny Davis. And Chairman Micah, this uh, hearing and the other events you have planned today provide a great opportunity to highlight our presidential libraries. Presidential libraries play a critical role in making presidential papers and artifacts available to researchers. These libraries also bring history to life for thousands of visitors each year. Most of the libraries operated by the National Archives also have a private foundation that sponsors their own programs and activities. Representative Lacey Clay, in his role last year as chairman of the Subcommittee on Information Policy, Census and National Archives, 
requested that the Government Accountability Office examine the laws and policies related to the presidential libraries and the private library foundations. GAO is issuing a report today that provides a helpful description of the three primary laws that address presidential libraries and the regulations and policies covering the relationships between libraries and private library foundations. I ask that this report be made a part of the hearing record. And an interesting aspect of presidential libraries is the relationship between libraries and the private library foundations. We are fortunate to have President Roosevelt's granddaughter here today. It was uh, President Roosevelt who first had the idea for a privately built but federally maintained library to house his presidential papers. The Presidential Libraries Act of 1955 formally established a policy for privately built presidential libraries to be transferred to the Federal Government. Subsequent laws established reporting and design requirements and some limitations such as requiring an, an operating endowment for each library, st starting with the George H. W. Bush Library. Finally, Mr. Chairman, the relationship between libraries and private foundations provide many benefits, but also can, be, can raise potential uh, issues. For example, the sharing of space within the same facilities create questions about the proper use of library facilities, especially for political activities. In addition, donations provided by the private sector to private foundations to fund the building of these libraries are private. GAO reports uh, that each library has a written agreement with its associated foundation, but the detail and scope of these agreements vary from library to library. GAO found that over time the agreements have become increasingly more detailed regarding staff, how library facilities can be used, and political uh, activities with regard to political activities. Some recent agreements also address potential conflicts of interest between the library and the foundation. And so, and, and one of the things that I will be interested to hear is the continuing resolution uh, recently passed by the House provides $32 million less for the National Archives than was, was enacted for fiscal year 2010 and almost $16 million less than the President's request for fiscal year 2011. I would love to know how our witnesses believe that those cuts are going to affect, if at all, the activities in those libraries and, 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 and just give us some information with regard to where, our, where you think our priorities may be. So often we spend a lot of time cutting and cutting and cutting, uh, but we cut off our past and it is kind of difficult to know your past if you don't know your, if you get to know your future and deal with your future if you don't have a history of your past. And so these, I consider these libraries very, very important. I appreciate the guests being here uh, today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. And uh, with uh, the request by the gentleman for record, he referred to to be made part of the record without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Let me yield now to uh, the Chair of the Economic Development, Public Buildings uh, and uh, Emergency Management Subcommittee. A gentleman from uh, California, Mr. Denham, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing on this very important subject uh, with the relationship between Federal Government and our Nation's public and private presidential libraries. As you know, in California, I have got both uh, the Nixon and Reagan libraries. Uh, the public benefit provided by these institutions is invaluable to the history of this Nation and to the insight they provide to the decisions that help shape our country. Uh, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses' uh, testimony on not only the mission and future uh, direction of the Presidential Libraries, but also on the funding aspect. Thank you. Other members seek recognition? Ms. Johnson, Ms. Rome. Okay. Gentleman from, uh, see Mr. Gowdy. You chair one of the subcommittees. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to commend you and Chairman Issa for uh, this extraordinary hearing and what is, um, I believe, going to be an extraordinary day. Given the uh, expertise, the amalgamation of experience that we have, I would rather hear from the witnesses and hear the questions than hear myself talk, so I would yield back. Thank you so much. Uh, other members seek recognition? Okay. 
No other members seek recognition. Then again, uh, what we'll do is go to our uh, panel of uh, witnesses, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Issa if uh, he would introduce the first three witnesses and uh, and uh, have them recognized. We don't have to swear these folks in today, Mr. Issa. I guess normally you do that on your panel, but uh, I think we can we can waive that since we're in your hearing room. Thank you, thank you. Well, uh, you're recognized uh, to recognize the uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, panelists. Thank you. Our first witness is the Honorable David S. Ferraro, the Archivist of the United States. And probably the most important part of today's hearing really has a great deal to do with how the National Archives and Record Administration can, in fact, oversee all but one of the people here in their organizations. Our second witness is Thomas Putman. Uh, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. And our third, Mr. Duke Blackwell, Director of the Ronald Reagan Library and a fairly constant host to me when I uh, get up there. We will start out by recognizing uh, the oh, no, no, you have three more to introduce. Uh, I'm going to, I will catch those when we get, when we get to them. But uh, we will go ahead and what we are going to do is uh, we will have the first three um, give their testimony. Um, we, we try to limit you to five minutes. Uh, if you have a lengthy statement or anything you would like to have included in the record, uh, that will be uh, uh, part of uh, the made part of the proceedings today. But first, uh, we will uh, recognize Mr. Ferrero. By the way, if, he, if David asks to have something put in the record, make sure it is not all of his archives. That could be over our, our <laughs> limit. <laughs> Well, uh, we will make note of that. Thank you, and you are recognized. Welcome, sir. Chairman Micah, Chairman Issa, and members of the committees, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today on the important role of the Presidential Libraries, both to the Nation and, their, and to their local communities. Presidential Libraries preserve, interpret, and present the history of American democracy in the 20th and 21st centuries through the words and deeds of our government. These libraries are among the country's finest examples of public archives, offering research rooms, interactive museums, and education centers to millions of researchers, students, and visitors each year. President Franklin D. Roosevelt's vision for his library created a process that has been followed by each succeeding president. He established a private foundation to raise funds for the construction of the library building that was then donated to the National Archives. Each library is supported by the Federal Government and in part by a Presidential Foundation. Situated around the country, Presidential Libraries reflect and enrich their local communities. They offer exceptional research facilities that are hailed for the personal service they provide to students and scholars. Each museum tells a unique story concerning the life and times of a 20th century and soon a 21st century President in the pivotal moments in history they faced. The library's extensive outreach to teachers and students is a powerful vehicle for civic engagement. As you know, 100 percent of all initial construction funding for the libraries, including the initial museum exhibit, comes from non-federal sources, the majority of which are private donations through the Presidential Foundations or their predecessor organizations. The construction of Presidential Libraries serves as an engine of economic growth in regional areas revitalizing communities and guaranteeing continued revenue streams for millions of national and international tourists. Local chambers of commerce or state tourism boards estimate that each visitor to the library spends an additional $1 to $200, depending on the community, during their visit at local restaurants and hotels. Thus, in, with nearly 2 million visitors visiting our museums in 2010, the support to the community is significant. $15 million added to the economy in Abilene, Kansas, $43 million in Boston, $55 million in Austin, Texas. Equally important is the educational and cultural impact presidential libraries have on their communities. Over 500,000 people attended cultural programming, conferences, and various speaker series at the libraries in 2010, where the country's first finest historians, political leaders, journalists, and biographers came to locales where they would not typically speak. Moreover, the libraries provided educational programs for 350,000 students and 5,000 teachers. At a hearing last year at which I testified, there was some concern about the use of resources for educational and cultural programs. As I said at that hearing, the problem of civic literacy is real, 
Access to public records is a part of the solution to that problem, and no one is better positioned to provide access to public records than institutions like the National Archives. And I would add the 13 presidential libraries and 12 regional archive programs across the country. One of the greatest challenges at the National Archives is the backlog we experience in processing many millions of pages of records so that those records can be accessible to the public. Several of our libraries have over 90 percent of their collections processed. Our most significant backlogs are in the Presidential Records Act libraries, Reagan through Bush 43. In 2009, Congress approved funds for 25 new archival positions for the four libraries with records controlled by the Presidential Records Act. These newly hired archivists are a remarkably talented group trained on processing presidential records and along with other streamlining measures are beginning to make a real difference in the volume of records processed. We expect this year to increase our processing by at least 1.3 million additional pages and more in future years as these new archivists complete their training. Presidential library foundations provide the funding for museum education and public programs websites, archive support and digitization, marketing and other initi initiatives. These contributions have allowed the presidential libraries to be leaders and innovators in the National Archives and beyond. Let me provide a few examples. Presidential libraries were among the first public archives and the first in the National Archives to develop interactive websites and online document-based educational programming. The Presidential Decision-Making Classroom pioneered at the Truman Library is now a featured part of the education programs in several libraries and served as a model for our education programs here in Washington. The Presidential Timeline, created through support of the Johnson Foundation in a partnership with the University of Texas Learning Center and all of the Presidential Libraries, in an is an innovative teacher-student resource for digital assets reflecting the life and administration of each of the Presidents. Because of the foundation funding, the Clinton Presidential Library became the federal government's first existing building to be certified at the LEED Platinum level. The George W. Bush Library will be built to LEED Platinum level as well. In addition to their ongoing annual support for the libraries, the foundations have contrib contributed tens of millions of dollars to renovate our permanent museum exhibits. The Hoover, Roosevelt, Truman, Kennedy, Johnson, Ford, Carter, Reagan, and both Bush libraries have recently completed new permanent exhibits are in, the, are, are in the planning stage for a new exhibit. I'm supported in this partnership by the, my advisory committee on the Presidential Library Foundation Partnership. This committee is made up of representatives of the various Presidential Library Foundations. Through these meetings, the public-private partnership can work to leverage our strengths and resources and resolve or at least understand how differences on our mission can sometimes strain our relationships. I meet with this committee at least twice a year to discuss and ask their advice on the activities of the National Archives, our strategic plans and vision, collaborative activities, funding, and legal issues that can affect the public-private partnership. The presidency is the one office selected by all Americans. Through our geographic disbursement, the presidential libraries are a positive force contributing to diverse communities, making history transparent, and strengthening the civic fiber of our nation. While I continue to believe in the importance of presidential libraries, it is my belief that technology will impact future presidential libraries. The size of digital collections at the Clinton and Bush 43 libraries is far greater than the paper records. In the near future, we can expect that a presidential library's collection will be mostly digital. Those documents acted on in a paper format will probably be digitized by the White House and only those documents of significant intrinsic value will be saved in their original format, such as documents annotated by the President, correspondence with world leaders, and decision memoranda. Long-term preservation and storage of digital records is a delicate but worthwhile option. Nonetheless, I believe Presidents in the future should continue to establish a Presidential Library if they wish to do so. Some collections may well be digital, but it is the curators, archivists, and educators who work in these libraries that make the collections accessible to all of our students and citizens. Thank you for this opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Putnam. Chairman Micah, Chairman Issa, and members of the committee, I'm Tom Putnam, Director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. 
I appreciate the opportunity to testify on behalf of my fellow library directors. We are so pleased that you have called this hearing and are honored to appear before you, along with David Ferriero, fellow historians, and especially with Anna Eleanor Roosevelt. Those of us who work in the Presidential Library System are indebted to her grandfather's vision, which led to the creation of the first Presidential Library. Franklin Roosevelt encouraged the country not to be fearful as he launched his presidency, during which, over time, we became the leader of the free world. Reflective of his infectious self-confidence, he valued transparency as an essential element of democratic government. Citizens must understand how their government works and have access to the documents that define their past. With the recent addition of the Nixon and George W. Bush libraries, our presidential library system, representing our 13 most recent former presidents, is made whole and has become a model for the world. Presidential libraries hold the memory of our nation. They are unique repositories that allow researchers and museum visitors an opportunity to relive the events that have shaped us as a people. Their educational programs create a more active and informed citizenry. I believe the current model works well and provides immeasurable benefits to our nation. We rest on four pillars. First, the private funds that are used to construct these buildings. Second, the federal funds that operate, maintain, and administer them. Third, the private support we receive from our respective library foundations. And finally, the revenue streams from our museums and related enterprises. One of the strengths of the present system is that it strikes the right balance between centralization and decentralization. Each library is built in a location determined by the President and his family. When visiting them, one is immersed in locales like Independence, Abilene, and Grand Rapids, in which our Presidents lived and matured politically. Yet we are also guided by standards set by the National Archives that ensure our holdings are protected, our museums objective, and our access universal. Over the years, there have been calls to centralize the presidential library system. In 1962, President Kennedy was asked if he would locate his library in Washington, D.C. He made two points in his reply. First, he stated that through the use of technology, it would eventually not matter where a library was located. The Kennedy Library recently made JFK's vision a reality by digitizing over 300,000 of the most important documents and photographs of his presidency and audio and video recordings of all his speeches and press conferences, providing worldwide access to them via our website. Second, JFK replied in 1962 that by locating these institutions throughout the country, each could serve as a vital education center connecting the residents of that region to their national government. In addition to our robust local planning, presidential libraries often collaborate on initiatives like national issue forums, global traveling exhibits, nationally televised conference, and interactive web-based timelines. Here, students can not only watch the iconic speeches of President Kennedy and Reagan at the Berlin Wall, they can also learn of the quiet diplomacy President George Herbert Walker Bush engaged in after the wall fell in uniting that divided land and view President Clinton reciting his favorite line from JFK's speech in Berlin, quote, freedom has many difficulties and democracy is not perfect, but we never had to put up a wall to keep our people in. I would not be honest, Mr. Chairman, if I did not admit that the presidential library system, like our democracy, is not perfect. I would like to conclude with two examples of the difficulties we face. The first is the question of the sustainability of the current model and the need to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship as the presidential library system ages and grows. The second is how we meet the need of releasing and opening materials as quickly as possible while also protecting national security interests. Ours is a young country with fewer coliseums and cathedrals than our European forebears, sites which, like others I visited as a college student, trying to understand the world my generation inherited and how we might make our mark upon it. This is the potency of presidential libraries in our land, serving as beacons to the world, shedding light on both the genius and the shortcomings of our history during what has been called the American century. Today, young people from all corners of the globe come to the Kennedy Library in Boston. They have often already visited the battlefields of Lexington and Concord. In our museum, they then listen to JFK's inaugural address in which he states, quote, we are heirs of that first revolution, and the beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. My colleagues and I feel privileged to share the story of John F. Kennedy and his 1,000 days as president with students from Binghamton to Beijing, Daytona to Dakar, as they seek to understand the history of our nation and our world and look to make their mark upon it. This is why we undertake to preserve and provide access to these priceless historical treasures for their ability to unite us as a country and a people, and to serve as the foundation on which new generations will self-confidently build our future.
Thank you. That's as close to a perfect finish as I've ever seen <laughs> in a committee. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Blackwood, next, next, you know the challenge. Five minutes. Back to follow. <laughs> Chairman Micah, Chairman Issa, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. When Franklin Roosevelt established the first Presidential Library, I am not sure even he envisioned how transformational they would become. His library and 12 others that have followed have had unparalleled impact on tens of millions of people. What he did for our country, our citizens, and most importantly, our school children continues to pay dividends. Today I will address the impact of presidential libraries and why they should continue as they are. I will argue that our mission should be multifaceted. Ultimately, though, everything starts with access and the definition of access should be expanded. Over the years, presidential libraries have grown, changed, and adapted. This growth is due in good measure to the support we receive from our attendant foundations. Working closely with the Reagan Foundation, the current library is working well and is a successful public-private partnership. The Foundation's support allows us to better serve the public. The Reagan Foundation provides hundreds of thousands of dollars in annual support and more than $50 million in capital improvements. This is on top of the $69 million they built the library. This support has had tremendous impact on three key areas more than doubling our attendance, expansion of education programs, and heightened awareness of our facilities. The Federal Government's involvement and support is also critical. NARA successfully leverages the Foundation's support, providing tremendous value for the government and the American people. With that support, we now serve many constituencies broadly categorized into three groups, citizens, students, and scholars. Providing scholars access to the collection is critical. If there is one criticism, it would be that they want more material sooner, and I would concur. At the Reagan Library, our archives team has improved efficiencies, set new standards, and even though we are processing more than 1.5 million documents with shorter queue times, the research community clamors for more. Let's look at the impact of the use of our materials. A single scholar might publish multiple articles, books, or blog entries that will reach hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of people. Should we just digitize everything then? Not so fast. There are practical concerns of funding, staffing, and processing time. Access through technology is one critical area that need, needs serious attention and significant investment. Why not just centralize? Tom presented a very strong case why presidential libraries should continue to grace different locations. I agree and would vigorously argue against centralization. Why it is critical to move towards a goal of digitization, we cannot lose sight of working with the original materials. Historic documents can inspire, motivate, and cause you to think differently. When you hold President Reagan's personal diary and you read, Getting Shot Hurts, or leaf through the day in infamy speech, it puts the researcher in a different frame of mind that can lead to new thinking. Access is more than just about the materials. Presidential libraries offer unique educational opportunities for hundreds of thousands of students across the country. So is access important to them? Archival access is not necessarily a priority for my daughter Abby's sixth grade class, but access to the museum, the curriculum, and the amazing Air Force One Dis Discovery Center certainly is. Abby's class and thousands like hers want to and deserve access to these opportunities. So should education be a part of our mission? Absolutely. Students represent the future, and learning about our history, the presidency, and civic engagement is critical for an informed citizenry. Presidential libraries offer an important avenue to access learning. At the Reagan Library, our approach is simple, the three E's. Excite, engage, and you will educate. That is what presidential libraries do. Our last constituency is the millions of citizens who visit us. They tour our museums, study our materials, attend our remarkable programs, and they too learn, all of which are different forms of access. So what is our mission and what should the future bring? In summary, presidential libraries are repositories of historical materials, tourist destinations, museum, gathering places for civic and literary debate educational institution, and places where communities learn. Our mission should reflect this diversity. Let us embrace President Roosevelt's vision and broaden it to the multifaceted definition of access. Furthermore, we need to be proactive with the use of technology. 
Presidential libraries are a unique institution that cause us to think, offer to look at, and perhaps question our government, help educate, and provide exciting opportunities for millions of people. I believe strongly they are vital. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, three beginning witnesses. Let me uh, now introduce the three uh, remaining panelists. We have first Dr. Thomas Schwartz, and Dr. Schwartz is the Illinois State historian. Um, he's involved with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, and that's sort of a hybrid. It's not federally funded as far as its operation, but the state and private uh, foundation, I believe, uh, and he'll explain uh, uh, their operations and their relationship with the federal government. And I think they got a little f federal money um, towards uh, some of their recent projects. Uh, then we have um, we are honored to have uh, Anna Eleanor Roosevelt. She chairs uh, the board of directors of the uh, Roosevelt Institute. Uh, it is quite fitting that we have uh, one of the family members who has been actively engaged uh, with the Presidential Library, and, and uh, that also being the first of the, our libraries. And then we have uh, Dr. Martha Kumar. Uh, she is a professor at uh, Towson. University, but also a distinguished, recognized presidential historian and uh, also author. And uh, we'll hear, uh, she's going to sum it all up for us, so we'll, we'll hear from here in just, just a second. Let me recognize uh, Dr. Thomas Schwartz again, uh, the Illinois State Historian and with the a Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. Welcome, sir, and you're recognized. Thank you. Chairman Mica, Chairman Issa, and members of the committee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify on the mission and future direction of presidential libraries. My comments will focus on the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Museum, its current relationship to the National Archives and Records Administration Presidential Library Museum System, and possible areas for further collaboration. This mirrors Abraham Lincoln's thinking when he declared, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it. The Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library was created in 1889 as the Illinois State Historical Library. Its mission was to collect the written history of the state of Illinois, an effort that also led to sizable holdings concerning its favorite son, Abraham Lincoln. Discussions since the 1980s on how to build a new facility for the library moved toward the larger concept of a library museum complex. A federal, state, and local funding partnership was created to finance the $167 million complex, most of that provided by the State of Illinois. The library, with its new name, opened in October 2004, and the museum opened on April 19, 2005. Of an FY 2011 budget of $12 million, the State of Illinois provides the largest source of revenue, with additional revenue streams provided by admission sales, parking and facility rental, and the support of the 501c3 Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation. The ALPLM has a staff of 66 full-time, 14 part-time, and more than 500 volunteers to maintain a 215,000 square foot complex under the administrative authority of the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency. With a total visitation of more than 2.5 million people from more than 100 nations since opening in 200, or 2005, the ALPLM has had annual attendance that surpasses any NARA presidential museum. Our programs range from temporary exhibits that have explored topics such as Lincoln's assassination, his views on agriculture, his actions as president-elect, to author talks, historically-based theater offerings, teacher workshops, activities for young children, and conferences and symposia on Lincoln, slavery, and his times. Perhaps our most ambitious project is the Papers of Abraham Lincoln. Begun in 1985, this project is compiled and in 2009 placed online all of Abraham Lincoln's legal documents by case and issued a four-volume print edition of selections from his legal practice. Currently, the project is scanning every letter sent to Lincoln and every document he wrote with the goal of placing the entire corpus of Lincoln's writings online. We hope to have the pre-presidential materials up by 2013 and the entire project completed by the end of this decade. Our interactions with the NARA libraries and museums have been few but friendly. Most requests are for the loan of Lincoln materials for special exhibits, several non-federal federal presidential museums being contemplated, 
and one to be added to the NARA system have sent planning teams to see the ALPLM and imagine how its elements might be incorporated into their facilities. The ALPLM is known for being different from traditional museums, with its emphasis on a compelling narrative of Lincoln's life, supported by creative uses of technology and immersive environments that actually place you within scenes of Lincoln's life. All of the senses are engaged, and the interactivity the visitor discovers is not that created by technology, but rather the intellectual and emotional engagement he or she feels with the unfolding story of Lincoln's life. These techniques inspired the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, for example, to incorporate many of them into their new orientation center and museum. Everyone in this room acknowledges the importance of presidential libraries and museums as vital to preserving our national history while providing the general public with a broader and deeper understanding of our past. Moving forward, we see several areas of cooperation to consider. One, sharing resources to the traditional loan of materials, digitization of collections, and extending both to joint ex exhibits with one or more presidential museum partners. Two, linking to one another's website, utilizing satellite uplink to offer joint programs, and providing comparative study and curriculum materials to encourage the public to explore the entirety of our presidential history and not simply that of one administration. Three, continuing the larger dialogue with presidential museums outside the NARA system on issues common to all. Finally, striving to be entrepreneurial in finding creative funding solutions to the long-term solvency issues facing all presidential libraries and museums. As Lincoln aptly reminds us, the struggle of today is not altogether for today. It is for a vast future also. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And let me recognize now and uh, welcome uh, Anna Ro Eleanor Roosevelt. Welcome. Chairman Micah, Chairman Issa. You may not be on there. Uh, okay, but pull it up real close. Okay. Great. <laughs> well, Chairman Micah, Chairman Issa, Ms. Norton, Mr. Cummings, members of the committees, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Anna Eleanor Roosevelt and I am Chair of the Board of Directors of the Roosevelt Institute, which is the nonprofit partner to the FDR Presidential Library and Museum in Hyde Park, New York. I have been a member of the Roosevelt Institute Board for more than 30 years, and I have been Board Chair for a little more than a year now. In my professional life, I am the Head of Global Corporate Citizenship for the Boeing Company and serve as the company's representative on the Board of the National Archives Foundation. The FDR Presidential Library and Museum is the nation's first presidential library. Prior to Franklin D. Roosevelt's decision to build the library in Hyde Park, the final disposition of presidential papers was left to chance, and much of that historical record has sadly been lost. President Roosevelt created an institution to preserve intact all his papers and related materials so that the nation could make use of the knowledge and experience contained there. The library's holdings include my grandfather's personal and family papers, the papers covering his public career at the state and national level, my grandmother's papers, as well as those of many of their friends and associates. It is a treasure trove of material that captures one of the most important eras in American history, the Great Depression and World War II from many perspectives and directions. My grandfather, as you may know, was a great collector of birds, ship models, stamps, books, documents, and many other items. He once recounted, after being elected to be the librarian of the Hasty Pudding Club at Harvard, some advice that he was given uh, by an old bookseller, never destroy anything. Much to my family's chagrin, my grandfather heeded that advice and kept everything. The result, as he himself put it, is that we have a mind for which future historians will curse me as well as praise me. FDR wanted to give these materials to the people of the United States and house them in an archive and museum built with private funds but maintained by the federal government. He felt it was important to keep all of his papers and artifacts together in a single collection. 
He also felt it was important that future generations who wish to understand him and his presidency should come to Hyde Park, to the community and home that helped shape him and meant so much to him high on the bluff above the Hudson River. Fully expecting to retire in 1940, work on the library began in 1938. But with the outbreak of World War II, my grandfather's plans for retirement had to be cast aside. Work on the library nevertheless went ahead as planned and it was open to the public on June 30, 1941, at the very time when most of Europe was suffering under the cruel dictates of fascist oppression. Taking note of this, my grandfather used the opening as an opportunity to remind the American people of how important history and the free access to information are to democracy. This latest addition to our nation's archives, he said, is being dedicated at a moment when government by the people themselves is being attacked everywhere. It is therefore proof, if any proof is needed, that our confidence in the future of democracy has not diminished in this nation and will not diminish. And he went on. The dedication of a library is in itself an act of faith, to bring together the records of the past and preserve them for the use of men and women living in the future. A nation must believe in three things. It must believe in the past. It must believe in the future. And it must, above all, believe in the capacity of its people so to learn from the past that they can gain in judgment for the creation of the future. As planned, the library was built with privately donated funds at a cost of $376,000, raised by a committee that was headed by a Republican, Waldo G. Leland. It was then turned over to the Federal Government on July 4, 1940, to be operated by the National Archives. By his actions, President Roosevelt ensured that his papers would become the property of the nation, housed in a library on the grounds of his Hyde Park home, also deeded to the nation upon his death, where they would be available to scholars. My grandfather's creation served as a precedent. The Roosevelt Institute supports the library's exhibits, its outreach and educational activities, and its special programs for its wide-ranging audiences. We understand our mission to be to preserve, celebrate, and carry forward the legacy and values of my grandparents. An important part of that mission is our partnership with the FDR Presidential Library. In 2003, the Roosevelt Institute joined the National Archives and the National Park Service in opening the Henry A. Wallace Visitor and Education Center, which serves as a joint visitor center for the Franklin D. Roosevelt National Historic Site and the Roosevelt Presidential Library, and as a conference and education center. It is also a valuable community resource used by hundreds of nonprofit organizations for meetings and events. The Wallace Center was constructed through a unique public-private partnership between the National Archives and Records Administration, the National Park Service, and the Roosevelt Institute, which raised substantial private funding in support of this project. The Roosevelt Institute supports all four of the library's main program areas on an ongoing ba basis, archives, museum, education, and public programs. The library's research operations are consistently one of the busiest in the entire presidential library system. The library serves thousands of on-site researchers and more thousands of researchers who contact the library through written requests, mostly via email. The Roosevelt Institute provides grants and aid to researchers demonstrating new scholarship in study of the Roosevelt era, as well as assisting the library in purchasing new books for the collection. We are working with the library to secure the necessary funding to digitize and make available online some of the most important documents in the collection. Since the opening of the FDR Libraries, William J. Vanden Heuvel Special Ex Exhibitions Gallery in 2003, the Roosevelt Institute has provided more than a million dollars to support changing exhibits in this gallery, along with enhancements and improvements to the library's permanent exhibits. 
This money made it possible for the library to purchase high-quality exhibit casework for the Special Exhibitions Gallery and to present many exhibit, special exhibits. The Institute has also provided over $5 million to create an exciting new permanent exhibition at the FDR Library. This new exhibition, the first complete renovation of the museum's permanent exhibition in the library's history, will employ state-of-the-art technology to bring the story of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt to new generations of Americans. It is scheduled to open in 2013. The Roosevelt Presidential Library offers document-based, curriculum-centered education programs for students ranging from the second grade to postgraduate level, including the United States Military Academy at West Point. The library conducts teacher workshops each year, attended by hundreds of teachers from across the United States and from more than half a dozen countries. There is only one full-time education specialist who is provided by the government. The Roosevelt Institute provides the remaining support to the Roosevelt Presidential Library's Education Department annually. This support is critical to the operation of the Library's Education Department as it provides the funds to hire four part-time New York State certified retired teachers and one part-time education clerk and to produce quality education materials that are used by students and teachers in the Hudson Valley, the tri-state area, and across the United States. Public programs and community outreach are at the core of the library's mission. The library offers a host of innovative programs and events to the general public each year. In sum, the work of the presidential, FDR Presidential Library and Museum and of presidential libraries generally is critically important for retaining and advancing the public's understanding of the nation's history and for making that history available in communities across the country communities from which our presidents have come. The FDR Library and each of 12 other presidential libraries tell the stories of the eras in which their presidents lived and the persons who rose to leadership within them. They make these stories available to thousands of Americans who do not have the opportunity come to come to Washington, D.C. and to the National Archives on a regular basis. It is important to remember, as my grandfather truly believed, that these investments are not support for memorializing specific individuals so much as they are investments that preserve, protect, and promote the broader scope of the history of this country, all of the dimensions of that history, the good and the bad, the successes and the challenges. As such, and with all that we can learn from the many generations of Americans who have gone before us. The support of the Federal Government provides the Presidential Libraries, pre represents an investment not in our past but in our future. I thank the Committee for the opportunity to testify today. Well, thank you again for your testimony. And now we will uh, recognize our last uh, witness and our uh, historian and Presidential Scholar, Dr. Kumar. Welcome and you are recognized. Yes, Chairman Micah, Chairman Issa. Might pull that up real close. Okay. Thank you. Is that okay? Yes, Chairman Micah, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Norton, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss presidential libraries and their importance to students, scholars, and government officials. As preparation for my testimony, I wrote political scientists who specialize in the presidency and asked them how their students use presidential library and in their work as presidency scholars, what difference presidential libraries make to their research. The responses came from all over the country and even from Canada with a uniform refrain of how important presidential libraries have become for those of us who examine executive leadership as, as well as those studying individual presidents. My informal survey established several points about the use of the importance of presidential libraries to students and scholars alike. First, presidential libraries are a national and a regional resource for those studying the operations of government and individual presidents. Having the libraries located in nine states in most regions of the country has brought the presidency to the public. 
The libraries have become a valuable part of many undergraduate and graduate programs and allowed students to open a window on the presidency without traveling to Washington. Students nationwide can afford to travel to one or more of these libraries and have rich experiences. For one professor, a charter bus trip to the Truman Library means having his students consider the Berlin airlift and the decision to drop the atomic bomb. Scholars depend on presidential libraries as a key resource for their own writing. The presidency section of the American Political Science Association has an annual award for the best book on the presidency. In reviewing the winners for the 20 years that the prize has been given, at least 75 percent of the books draw heavily on presidential library materials. Presidential libraries are a resource as well for those in government. The 9-11 Commission made heavy use of presidential library materials. In recent Supreme Court nomination hearings, Senate uh, Judiciary Committee members and staff reviewed presidential library files to see what actions and recommendations John Roberts and Elena Kagan had in, in their service in the Reagan and Clinton White Houses. White House staff in all recent administrations have called up materials from presidential <coughs> libraries. As successful as the library visits of the faculty I have polled are, the professors singled out the archivists as the key to the success of their trips to the libraries. With millions of records in each library, sifting through for relevant materials is a challenge for resources, for researchers. The archivists fill in this gap. Second, presidential libraries are important to what we know about the presidency as an institution and about individual presidents. Materials in the library allows us to test common assumptions <laughs> we have about the presidency how it operates and what particular presidents did while they were in office. The President's Daily Diary, many of which are available online, track the minute-by-minute -minute movements of a president from one room to another. The diary records who was in meetings and when they come and go. Through such careful tracking, we know who was with a president when he was considering particular policies, and we have the documentary records preserved as well. One professor used the daily diaries to test the idea that President Reagan had relatively short work days by comparing the length of the work day of several recent presidents. It came out that President Reagan worked a similar work day to Presidents Johnson and Nixon and a longer one than Presidents Kennedy and Eisenhower. Audio recordings of meetings are also valuable for understanding important decisions and how they played out, as one can see in the recordings of President Kennedy's meetings on the Cuban Missile Crisis, which are in audio. Third, cooperative ventures can be an aspect of the model for future libraries. There are many ways in which presidential libraries can work together with those studying the, pre the presidential actions. In some cases, there are groups beyond the library foundations that provide funds for researchers to travel to one or more libraries. Students, too, can work as interns or in work-study programs to provide needed work in appropriate areas in the libraries. An example of a cooperative uh, venture between scholars and presidential libraries is the White House interview program. The program is built around interviews with key former White House officials to help prepare those coming into the White House in 2001. The materials were also used in 2009. The interviews are housed at individual libraries, with many of them available online. The project demonstrates what is good for scholars can be also good for those coming into the government and for presidential libraries. Everyone benefits when people, students, scholars, and the public learn about their government and its leaders. Well, thank you for your testimony. I want to thank all of our witnesses. Um, um, again, I think this is a rather historic uh, joint uh, hearing between uh, two committees, uh, and the first time that uh, we have approached the subject in this manner. Uh, again, the important mission of our presidential libraries uh, uh, and their current status. What we will do is start with um, a little round of questions. and. Uh, I'm going to ask our archivists a uh, uh, couple to start. Uh, right now, a big question in Washington is uh, spending and uh, 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 national finances. 
Um, you don't have a huge budget for the uh, libraries, but um, I see in um, uh, approximately $77 million is the uh, FY10 estimated cost. Is, is that correct? 76.2. Okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, of that, it looks like uh, operational uh, costs, op operations and maintenance was 27 million, programs 35 million, and I guess uh, some of the uh, renovation costs were about nine or 10 million. Um, I, I had the opportunity to visit the Kennedy Library, um, and uh, I, don't, I don't think this is planned for my visit, but they had a big bucket uh, in the, uh, uh, and it's a beautiful atrium, but there's a big bucket and water coming down. Um, and they assured me that uh, they that they had renovation and repairs underway. Uh, do we have a capital program for all of these uh, libraries? Uh, and uh, I guess the submission goes through you and a, initial approval. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. Let me preface my answer by a, a story about the Kennedy Library. I.M. Pei was the architect, and I was there at the opening. And that atrium, sitting out there on the water, a, a visitor came up to I.M. Pei and said, aren't you afraid it's going to leak? And he said, of course it's going to leak, <laughs> an architect. We have a, um, a, a uh, repair and renovation budget uh, within the National Archives, and we have a master plan, space master plan, that um, identifies all the needs across all, 13, all 12 of the facilities, soon to be 13 facilities, um, with an estimate of um, expenditure each year. Um, that will be severely reduced um, in the coming year. One of the other things I noticed, I was quite shocked to to see the, um, well, it, all the uh, exhibits in all the libraries are remarkable, but uh, I was really a bit surprised to see the condition, uh, sort of an aged condition of the uh, uh, Kennedy ex exhibit. Um, in fact, I mentioned to Caroline Kennedy and to uh, our departing uh, uh, Patrick Kennedy representative, uh, the need to update some of those. Um, do we have a, a schedule for updating some of those? Uh, There's been a exhibits? huge focus, uh, especially at Kennedy, on um, digital uh, activities to get the um, as much content out into people's um, hands around the country but, first. Um, but there's also planning around up, updating the exhibit space, the mm -hmm. current exhibit space. Mm -hmm. I heard uh, this. Uh, Roosevelt talk about that, and I'm not sure the stage, do we have an invite, uh, does anyone look at, again, the overall picture of putting some of this uh, uh, incredible information, uh, you know, on digital or the latest, using the latest technology in all of these libraries? Every one of the presidential libraries has um, been investigating, has done something in the area of uh, digitization and long-term planning for as much content as we can afford. Now, back to the financing. I understand different libraries have foundations and uh, they're supportive. Is there any estimate you could give to us uh, as to what uh, additional funds are uh, provided or what percentage of uh, additional programs are underwritten by the private sector? Um, I can get you that figure. I don't have it off the top of my head, but each one of, uh, I think it's safe to say that each one of the presidential libraries is pretty creative, innovative, and entrepreneurial in uh, identifying private support for a number of their activities. Then I noticed, too, that uh, I was looking at the admissions and the activity from visitors for the different libraries. It seems to taper off uh, again as the presidents fade into history. Um, that, that leaves, um, uh, again, a bigger burden on the federal government to underwrite the operations. And also I noticed that some of the libraries, the Department of Interior is involved, uh, their uh, costs and figures are not included in, in your budget. Um, how much, uh, again, uh, do we look at the, the overall long-term mission, the re reduction in admissions, and then contributions from other agencies? 
that is certainly something that, that is in my consciousness. And you are right, there is a relationship between the, um, the date of the presidency and the, and the attendance. On the Park Service um, collaboration, those, those sites where we have the um, homestead, um, that is where there is a, um, a, a history of, re of a Park Service involvement in the, uh, in the site. Okay. Then uh, we have got Mr. Schwartz uh, had an opportunity to visit there in Illinois, and that is a private uh, uh, state operation. Um, I also uh, was <laughs> informed the Federal Government had prop, uh, promised some help on the capital side and only met uh, about half of its uh, contribution. Maybe you could tell us how you are funded and how a uh, Federal commitment unkept uh, affects your operation and, uh, and your budget? Um, the original funding plan was that the State, uh, the two structures came to a total cost of $115 million. That was the estimate. And the idea was the State would provide $50 million, the Federal Government would buy, provide $50 million, and the City of Springfield would provide the property and the remaining amount. Um, it ended up that the Federal Government came forward not with the grant fully funded, but uh, a matching plan. And so um, State regulations require for a construction project for all the money to be in place before construction begins. Um, and so the State actually had to then finance the, the full amount. And we were of that $50 million match over five years we were able to recoup about $35 million. Okay. Uh, Ms. Roosevelt, um, you had mentioned that you are in the process of uh, digitizing some of the records. Is that also with Federal help or is that a private uh, activity? And where do you see the Federal Government helping you in the future, again, as far as protecting some of these national assets and treasures? Well, um, that particular project, I would have to uh, refer to our uh, librarian to make sure. But I know that whenever the library has a program need, um, we are partners with them and we, we work with them to discover what is the need to produce the result that is best for the library program. And so we often do co-funding on, pro on projects. And I w would assume that the uh, uh, that would be part of the, of the digitizing project. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, um, have any of you worked with the Library of Congress or you have joint efforts going on uh, uh, with the Library of Congress? Yes, uh, Mr. Schwartz, and uh, maybe you could tell us that relationship. Uh, the, the papers of Abraham Lincoln, uh, right now the last two major repositories of, of Lincoln's papers that we need to scan are those at the Library of Congress and the National Archives. We have finished the scanning of the collections out at Archives II, and we are now in the main archives, and um, we are at the Library of Congress, and I think we hope to wrap up uh, both those scanning projects in the next uh, few years. Okay. And uh, uh, the noontime, uh, or when we recess, we will hear from the Librarian of Con Congress. And this afternoon, uh, some of the questions that we can't get to uh, with the uh, members of the panel and other, other directors and um, uh, those active with some of the other presidential libraries that have joined us today will have an opportunity. So if you think of a question or we, ha we can get more to the answer, I saw it from uh, Ms. Roosevelt. Uh, in that symposium that starts this afternoon. So with that, let me yield to Ms. Norton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Uh, Ferrero, I have a, a, a question from you. You are, of course, aware <laughs> as a Federal agency that we are in the midst of making large cuts. Uh, in Federal agencies, we have to make many of them. Um, in your testimony, you noted that the Clinton library is uh, platinum lead and that the Bush library is also expected to be platinum le uh, lead. And of course, in, in our committee, we, 
we, we promote uh, this because of the enormous savings that can be documented. In this case, uh, the savings would be to the taxpayers. Um, have you advised or do you think it would be important to advise those who build these libraries in light of the fact that the operations are paid by the taxpayers of the United States, that these libraries should be built to the highest lead standards uh, available? I, cer I certainly would agree to that, and I would um, suggest that any future library that we build will be built to those specifications. Thank you very much. Um, again, uh, a, a question going to uh, the need to make savings uh, particularly uh, in the year or two headed, uh, there, there's great concern uh, here about savings. The, however, even the, the um, Deficit Commission warned about doing cuts that were too stringent this year and advised to wait uh, a couple of years lest we send the fragile economy back. So people like me are looking for things to cut. Uh, that uh, that meet the necessity to cut, um, but um, that may not have that effect. Now, I I note um, uh, in, in light of the fact that the the taxpayers pay for the operations in applying the cuts to the archives. Um, and let me preface this by saying I've sat through hearings where the archivist has, has uh, raised my uh, very serious concern about the underfunding of the archives and your ability to maintain the precious uh, historical papers of the United States. It, shouldn't the cuts be applied as little as possible to your official work, your official documents with perhaps uh, the libraries and their operations contain, uh, 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 taking somewhat more of the cuts since that is operations uh, alone? I mean, if you had to distribute the cuts and that is who that's who's going to have to do it, uh, well, you, you, cry, you cry up here about the maintenance of, and well, you might, we all should shed tears about the maintenance of this uh, repository, then you have got to decide where the money goes, whether well, some powerful people in the libraries uh, who want their operations just as they are. There are not so many powerful people uh, speaking for the papers uh, that, that you complain you don't have the money to, to, to upkeep. So how would you distribute these, this, this, this funding? Well, I, I would just remind you that those papers that are sitting in those 13 repositories that we call presidential libraries are Federal records, and they are my responsibility. I'm asking about the, the papers sitting right in the National Archives. They are part of those records, the Federal records and Presidential records. I am asking about the operations, Mr. Perry. I wish you would answer my question directly. I am not asking about the records. I am asking that's about when you have got to apply uh, funds to operations and, and you can make cuts in operations versus cuts in official documents, whether they are, as you say, in the presidential libraries, and what or whether they are here in the District of Columbia, I'd like an answer to my question. And what I'm trying to explain is that my approach to the cuts treated presidential records and federal records with the same level of. I, I accept that wasn't my question. My question was operations, cuts in operations versus cuts in Those records. Those cuts in operation were applied equally across federal records and presidential records. So the restrictions that I that is described you can't around be serious that yeah. that in, in, in the operations of the archives or of, of the, uh, 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 well let's take your own operations you would give as much weight to uh, whether or not there's going to be a, another security guard uh, as you would to maintaining the records themselves protection of records whether they're federal records or presidential records are equally. I am not important. talking about the difference between the two records. I am talking about the operations that the taxpayers pay, but they pay for, 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 for the presidential libraries. The taxpayers pay for that security in the presidential libraries. That is what I am talking about. 
And I am And they pay for other operational matters in the Presidential Library. That is right. So I am not talking about the records. I am talking about the operations. And I am saying that my approach to security in this particular case, security of the collections, whether about security guards, would be the same in a Presidential Library as it would be at 700 All right, Pennsylvania Mr. Uh, <laughs> uh, I see I am not going to get an answer to the question. I am not asking about security. Operations has to do with a whole lot more than security. I gave you an example as whether you, you have one more guard or one less guard. But uh, I would be very concerned if you just uh, were, were, to, were, were to find it as, as, as easy uh, to apply funds to operational matters.